This conference will now be recorded. Okay, I'd like to call the village board to order for Tuesday, September 22nd. Roll call, please. Trustee Allison Williams. Here. Trustee Paul. Here. Trustee Zerbel. Here. Trustee Mark Williams. Here. Trustee Kabaki. Here. Trustee Melcheski. Here. President Kardaski. Here. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with the liberty and justice for all. And please remember our men and women in uniform throughout the world. Um, I need a motion to approve the agenda. So move, move the approval of the agenda as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve that agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. I need action on the open and closed minutes from August 25th, 2020. Move to approve. Second. Motion and a second to approve those minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Number six, comments from the public must be limited to items not on the agenda, must state name and address, limited to five minutes. The board's role is to listen and not discuss the items. Personnel issues cannot be discussed nor individuals named and board is not able to take action at this meeting. Would anybody from the public like to speak? Okay, could you come up and state your name and address, please, for the record? My name is uh, Jerry Rezepka, 461 Oak Lawn Avenue, Green Bay. That's why I'm on. Okay, Rick Rice. Uh, let me see, where am I at? Oh, 465 Oak Lawn, <laughs> Ashwaubenon. Okay. All uh, right, go ahead, Jerry. I have a question, no, question and a comment. Question is, what kind of businesses can I run in a residential neighborhood out of my garage? Comment being, live in a residential neighborhood. There is a business across the street from me that is very irritating and the name of the business or the business is dog training. Okay. And, and kenneling. And kenneling. Dogs are walked up and down the street, said to be trained for uh, service dog. They are not being trained for service dogs because I talked to the owner one day and I asked her, I says, what are you doing? What are you, how are, what are you training these dogs for? She said, to sit, to heal, to listen to the owner. Okay, that's not service related. And uh, one day, their three dogs and another six dogs were in the garage barking. And so at one time there's nine dogs in this house area okay my complaint is that that's not right i can't have nine dogs in my garage i don't have a business and i didn't think that a business could be run in a garage to kennel dogs number one train dogs number two and the third being service-related dogs, which are not being trained to be service-related. That's my comment. Okay. Okay, my, my take, there's eight people that directly are involved with the house in question. Three in the back, one here, one here, and, and three of us across. Not a single person that I talked to was ever asked if, it, if they had any objections to doing this. I, I asked the girl, I said, you know, what are you doing? She said, I'm training dogs. I said, well, this is a residential area and you got a single stall garage and you got nine dogs in there and they're barking all day and you're not training them. I don't care. So now I told her, if you can have a dog kennel, I'm gonna get a used tire uh, thing in my garage. I'm gonna start selling tires. Oh, you can't do that, that's illegal. Duh. So it's, it, it's a situation now where I need three or four phone calls. I talked to the zoning guy. 
I talked to the code enforcement, and I talked to the community service guy. Excrement. Huh? Excrement in the back. Oh, yeah, that's next. And I, I called again today to find, get an update. I never got a call back. Um, I want to know, we want to know if there's a, a certain time limit that this can be, can go on to, or can this go on unheated garage in the winter? Could you train dogs in there all winter? Not cooled in the summer, with nine dogs in there, garage door is closed, there's four little kennel boxes, dogs are in there, our shot records provided, whatever. Backyard wasn't cleaned up for six months. And, uh, you know, the lady to the west, we get a northwest wind or northeast wind, she can't even be in her backyard. So, uh, you know, it's, it's maybe, and, and I also asked her how come she was doing it out of her garage just because I can't afford to rent any place. Well, and the lady who's doing it isn't, doesn't, isn't even the homeowner. She's the roommate of the person who owns the house. So today there was only two dogs there that we saw. But like I said, there's been up to nine and 10 dogs in that garage. And there's everything from little kick me dogs to German shepherds. And, she, and I'm a dog guy. I, I've hunted with Steve over there already. I'm a dog guy. I got German wire hair. He's a great dog. He don't bark, you know? She says she needs a service dog. And yeah, and then she said one of the dogs in her house, which they have three, which we've ignored for two and a half years. Um, she said one of those is a service dog. Well, at quarter after 11 on Sunday, when I was coming down the street from my walk, she left and she got home at 1.30 in the morning. Her service dog wasn't with her. So I don't know if anybody looked into that or what's going on, but like I said, we live in a residential area. It's quiet. I've been there 46 years, 44 years. Yeah, you got issues. You got a little problem here, problem there, but uh, no, you don't run a kennel out of a single stall garage. What is it, maybe 24 by 16 maybe? Yeah. You don't do that, I'm sorry. Okay. But that's all I got. Okay. Well, as I stated, we can't we can't respond yep. to anything, yep. but we'll uh, talk to staff about this. All right. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks. Okay. And this gentleman has a comment. Name is Bob Lotto, 1657 Cormier Road, in Ashwaban. Um, in your meeting last month, I uh, read in the Times paper about this person that was uh, refusing to pay for organizing uh, Black Lives Matter. And I was surprised that there was no response. I didn't know the board couldn't respond. So I was wondering where the response was coming from. And I guess it wasn't coming from anywhere. So I decided to come this month and do some responding. Um, one of the things that bothered me quite a bit was uh, her fiance's statement that not, there's no blacks on the board. I don't know if he knew or not that you had to be elected to be on the board. You can't be appointed. Now last month you had someone appointed because of a vacancy and only one person applied for that and he happened to be white. So if you want a black on the board, you need to run for it or apply for an open seat. So I hope that gentleman learns that and then decides to run or have somebody run to represent them. Um, another thing that he kind of alluded to was about um, wanting change in Ashwaubenon and for the betterment of the blacks. And I would just like to say I hope he followed up with you people somehow. If there's no response in this forum, then find one some other way so that he gets some of his answers uh, of what, whatever his current concerns are. I wish he would have mentioned some so a person could think about what he was, the problem he was having. And the last thing, the woman that, uh, organized it and doesn't want to pay the bill, which would leave it to us taxpayers to do. All she would have had to do is what I did today, came down and asked for the code that covers these things. And I'd just like to read them quickly. 
special events means any parade, run, walk event, exhibition, march, ceremony, or any similar display in a, upon the street, the park, or other uh, public places in the village. No person shall participate in or organize any event unless a special event application has been obtained, completed, and approved by the Chief of Public Safety. The event organizer shall complete the application for a special event with village clerk at least 45 days prior to the event. I would see maybe for some of this protesting going on, they might cut that down a few days or something. And the last thing in the bottom was uh, every organ organizer is required to make a receptive fee payable to the village and will be valid for the duration of the event only. Additionally, Organizer shall reimburse the village for services provided by the village personnel as determined by the director of public safety and designee or designee, which tells anybody you're liable for the expense. So how that lawyer came here last month and uh, thought that didn't apply, not quite, I'm not a lawyer, but I think it reads pretty plainly. So in closing, I would like to say we all would like change to some extent, but we have to work at it. We don't just demand it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else want to talk in the open comment? Okay, move on to number seven, written communications and or announcements. Uh, I have one, Madam President, but I will read it into the record under 9G. Okay. Okay, number eight, <clears throat> action on consent agenda, discussion and possible action on committee members, action on operator's license, investment report, department reports, and then action on election inspector appointments for the 2020-21 election cycle. I would like to pull um, the election inspector one out, and then I can, I'll can i have you approve the consent agenda without that item in there. Move to approve consent agenda A, B, D, and E. Second. Motion and a second to approve consent agenda A, B, D, and E. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carried. Hey, Patrick, we have a change to C. Yes, if the board would entertain uh, to amend the list by adding two more names, uh, two more citizens have agreed to participate in the November 3rd election and thereafter. Uh, if you would, to amend by adding Patricia Birnbaum and citizen Daniel Sumnick. If I could have that in a motion. In I'll, a second. I'll make a motion to approve the list of uh, election appointments with the additions that were just stated. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the election inspector appointments and adding the two that Patrick stated. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Okay, number nine, action items. 9A, action on Class B beer license for J. Paul LLC, DBA Chili Johns. Before you is a request by J. Paul LLC doing business as Chili Johns at 3120 Packer Land Drive. Uh, they are located at the former Tea Bacon Barbecue location. Uh, they are seeking approval of a Class B beer license to complement their food menu. All necessary paperwork and fees have been received. There are no issues. This was approved at committee unanimously in a five to zero vote. Uh, Mr. Jason Wordle, uh, one of the partners of Chili John's is here. If you have any questions for him. Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, when TJ Bacon's was in there, they had license to serve alcohol, I am assuming. They did indeed. Okay. Now, if there's no other questions, I'll move to approve the application. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the Class B beer license for J. Paul LLC DBA Chili <clears throat> Johns. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Motion carried. 9B, discussion and possible action on DNR VOA partnership request on EOC projects under our jurisdiction. Rex. Hello, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, Jeremy's gonna be putting on the screen uh, Bree Kupski. Bree is with the Wisconsin DNR. She is the Green Bay, uh, Lower Fox River um, Area of Concern Coordinator. And uh, Bree approached uh, me about a month ago, uh, maybe a little more, about potentially partnering with the village of Ashwaubenon on uh, doing some projects within Ashwaubenon Park, uh, as well as Ashwaubenon Creek, uh, which borders the west side of Ashwaubenon Park. Um, this is very similar uh, to the partnership we had with Fish and Wildlife to use the uh, Great Lake Restoration Initiative as well as the um, NRDA grants. Um, so Bree's gonna be doing a little uh, presentation here real quick, uh, just a PowerPoint on, on what some of the potential projects are that are there. For them to move forward um, with any of these projects, they need to have uh, the village blessing that we are willing to work with them. Um, I should state uh, out of the gate here um, that through our discussions and, and what I reiterated is that you know this would basically be staff time. Us, if, if we if, if they apply for a grant and, and get the grant and are, and, and, and are able to use it for this partnership with us, um, and we'd apply for it, I should say, um, basically it would be staff time. It wouldn't be any you know dollars that are being expended. It would be the grant money, very similar to the other NRDA GLRA funding projects that we, we did. So if Bree is out there right now, I believe she is. Bree, um, why don't you go ahead? I'm just trying to set the stage for you here. And uh, you can explain a little bit to the board on, on what some of the potential projects in the park uh, would be. Sure, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, great. Well, thanks Rex for introducing me. Um, and thanks for letting me participate and take some time up on your agenda. Um, like Rex said, my name is Bree Kopsky. Um, I'm an area of concern coordinator at um, WDNR and what I do is help coordinate restoration and remediation projects in the Great Lakes. Um, my focus is on the Lower Green Bay and Fox River as well as the Lower Menominee River. Um, so I was just going to give a really brief context um, on this program just because I find that some people have heard of it and some people are like, what are you talking about? Um, there's 43 areas of concern throughout the Great Lakes region in the United States. Uh, we have 31 of them, the rest being in Canada. Um, what really characterizes these areas is that they're places where there's been some really significant environmental degradation um, and contamination as compared to other areas of the Great Lakes. Um, they're often pretty urbanized, industrialized harbors, just like we have here, um, where there's a lot of sediment contamination, and that poses a, a significant health risk to human health as well as to fish and wildlife production. Um, and we often try to, you know, work to prioritize them um, because they can, you know, affect a greater area of the Great Lakes. Um, so in Wisconsin, we have five areas of concern that were designated, um, the St. Louis River on Lake Superior, and then um, on Lake Michigan, we have Lower Green Bay Fox River, Sheboygan River, and Milwaukee Estuary. Um, the Lower Menominee River actually just had that area of concern designation removed because we completed all the work we needed to to get it out of that sort of severely degraded category. Um, though WDNR and other partners are going to continue working on projects to improve the river um, going forward. All right, so let's I can advance. Um, so I was um, this area designated as an area of concern. It really comes down to three major issues, being you know. We had really and continue to have really degraded water quality and have for you know the better part of a century. Um, the Fox River was actually named one of the 10 most polluted rivers in the country by the federal government back in the sort of early 1900s. Um, we also have you know a major contaminated sediment problem or had. Um, you might have heard that you know the PCB cleanup on the Fox River is um, the largest PCB cleanup to happen um, or effort um, globally. And then of course we have a lot of um, loss of fish and wildlife habitat because we fill in wetlands and um, just all these other sort of indirect issues contributing to um, fish and wildlife. So you can see on the map um, on the slide. Um, oh, is there a question? I'll stop for a second. Nope, okay. Um, there's a red boundary on that map that really delineates where the area concern boundaries are and where the majority of work that I help coordinate um, actually occurs. Um, so the last seven miles of the Fox River and then a 21 square mile area um, of the Bay of Green Bay. 
Um, we've made a lot of progress um, towards improving water quality and, you know, these other things that I've just talked about, um, but we still have a lot of work to do, and I'm just going to quickly cover that um, on the next couple of slides. Um, so improving water quality, you know, um, that's a big work in progress, as I'm sure you are all aware. Um, this is a picture that was taken by a colleague of mine that's actually at a Shrava May Park at that boat landing. Um, and what is really causing these issues um, now is, you know, runoff from sort of these um, agricultural um, and um, sources that are in this big watershed geographic area uh, that eventually makes its way to the Fox River and Bay of Green Bay and provides a lot of available nutrients for algal blooms like these to get established. And, you know, when we see stuff like this, you know, it's um, kind of a, you know, it can be a public health issue. It can also be sort of this um, aesthetics, aesthetically sort of displeasing thing. And it can impact fish and wildlife also. Um, so the sources of this kind of pollution are not easy to pinpoint, um, difficult to regulate within that sort of larger regional um, watershed context, um, way outside the boundaries of where I work um, oftentimes. Um, but we're, you know, one of the many programs, initiatives and partners that are working together um, to work with agricultural producers and communities within that watershed to find ways to reduce phosphorus and sediment runoff. So I'm sure you're aware, you know, New Water has done a lot of sort of adaptive management work in Ashwaubenon and Dutchman um, Creek watersheds that are just going to continue to provide benefits to water quality. Um, uh, the other big issue, as I mentioned, was we have that contaminated sediment problem, namely through the PCBs that were discharged during the paper making process um, back in the 50s and 60s. Um, I just included some of the bigger highlights from that work, you know, one being that 8.2 cubic million yards of contaminated sediment was remediated. Sorry, not remove my typo. Um, from the river, you know, over the last, you know, uh, several years. Fun fact is if that, you know, you were to load all of that sediment that we've remediated into dump trucks and line them up, line them up, excuse me. It spanned from Green Bay all the way to London, England. So there was a lot, a lot of sediment that came out of the river um, or was remediated. <clears throat> This project was paid in full by the responsible parties and not taxpayers. Um, and there were around 140 workers on site daily, which brought in this really talented workforce because it was this very innovative project um, to get this um, scale of sediment remediated from the river, um, which also kind of contributed to enhancing our local economy. Um, so there's a lot of direct environmental benefit, benefits and then sort of indirect benefits came out of that project. Um, and sort of last but not least, um, now that we have completed that project that was completed in 2020, um, we're really at the stage of looking at improving fish and wildlife habitat. Um, we didn't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because so much dredging needed to happen in the river. We knew, you know, if you put habitat in the river and then need to dredge it, you're just going to have to take it back out. Um, so that's really what I'm here to talk to you about um, a little bit tonight. We've been working over the last few years with um, lots of experts, natural resource managers, local government staff um, to come up with some ideas that we think can get the biggest bang for a buck in terms of improved fish and wildlife habitat. And we've come up with this list of 18 different project areas and concepts for each of those areas for habitat improvement, um, three of which are located either near the village of Ashwaubenon or um, actually on village of Ashwaubenon property. Um, including an in-water fish um, reef project near the De Pere Dam, um, a project in Ashwaubenon Creek with some elements actually um, that we are, you know, would like to consider for Ashwaubenon Park with the village of Ashwaubenon um, to help build off of that, you know, previous project that Rex was mentioning, and then a project in uh, Dutchman Creek in the adjacent shoreline. So I'm just going to touch on each one of these three uh, projects really quickly. Um, I'll stop for one second to see if there's any questions so far on anything I've presented. No. Okay. All right. So this, um, I'm just going to talk about Pure Dam real quick. This is just kind of like a, you know, um, keeping everyone in the loop on what's going on with this. Um, none of this uh, work, I, I don't believe, will be occurring on any village of Ashwaubenon properties, but obviously um, because of the, you know, it's an adjacent riparian landowner, obviously we want to make sure that everybody is um, informed and engaged in this project. Um, so this panel I put together is of aerial imagery actually taken near the De Pere Dam. Um, you can see this first picture kind of um, up on the top left. Um, it's from 1938. And what you'll see here in this bend of the river is um, there used to be tons and tons of um, aquatic vegetation in there that was great for, you know, fish spawning habitat for other kinds of wildlife. And as you cycle through the years, you know, 1960, 1978, 2017, you see that, you know, this has all been completely um, lost essentially. 
Um, part of that's due to the water quality issues, but there's a lot of extensive dredging that happened right in here that really deepened um, this area of the river. Um, some flow issues probably from the dam <clears throat> that's making it really difficult for new vegetation to grow. So a big part of what we'd like to see happen is, you know, trying to figure out a way to get some uh, vegetation uh, reestablished in here. And then also some other fishery stuff. So um, looking at doing like these submerged log cribs um, along this Brown County shoreline area um, that would be submerged. Um, we've talked with the city of De Pere um, about maybe doing some walleye spawning reef enhancements. And then in the sort of deeper part of the river, um, looking at doing some fish spawning reef um, enhancements for sturgeon and whitefish and walleye specifically. So those are the sort of main um, elements of that project that we'd be looking to sort of plan and design out over the next couple of years. Um, onto the Schwabenon uh, Creek and Schwabenon Park. This is just kind of a map. This yellow boundary shows you generally where we think the, pro um, the <clears throat> project boundaries would be. Um, so as far as the actual footprint, you know, Rex and, you know, the village has done this great job of um, removing the invasive buckthorn along the majority of uh, shoreline. So you can kind of see this is a picture of that buckthorn. Um, there's still some small problem areas that could be tackled, um, as well as just the follow-up treatments in the area of the shorelines that have already been managed. It definitely takes a lot of persistence to keep buckthorn at bay um, in this longer term. Um, another thing is that, you know, there's a section um, um, of the shoreline right around uh, here. That's a little steeper, um, has a little bit more of an unvegetated understory. Um, it could definitely be improved um, because, you know, right now what's probably happening is we're getting a little bit of erosion off that bank. Um, so sediment kind of running off into the creek, which doesn't help with water quality in the creek. Um, and, you know, it could just definitely be improved and be a little bit more aesthetically um, pleasing just in general. Um, there's many methods of, you know, stabilization of stream banks that can provide a lot of different benefits. Um, so we'd be kind of, you know, looking to talk with the village about, you know, is there something that we can do in here that keeps a lot of that, um, you know, the nice trees, the nice big oaks and things that you guys have out there, but it helps sort of vegetate this understory um, with other plants. Um, another thing that, or another area that I really um, like about Ashwabame Park is this little inland wetland area, which is located um, right around here. Um, it's kind of this nice little refugia. Actually, it's kind of tucked um, a little bit farther away from where a lot of the people hang out. Um, if you go and spend time there, which I'm sure many of you do, you know, you can see like little herons and all sorts of things that really enjoy um, using this area. And that could just be improved by doing some easy stuff, removing some um, buckthorn along the shoreline, um, getting rid of some of the sort of, um, you know, not as nice vegetation, that kind of stuff to continue having it be that nice refugia for wildlife. but. Um, maybe also making it a little bit more accessible for people to view. Um, and then the last thing is, this is another area that's just right um, near here, you know, where you have the um, fire pits that I think the Boy Scout troops use. Um, you know, this along with other areas have a lot of potential for maybe some sort of like rain garden or meadow plantings, things like that, where it's not just turf grass that, you know, a lot of pollinators like, and um, usually, you know, when you get those other things in parks, you know, they're often, kind of nice education and outreach things too um, for the community, you know, putting in just signage and things like that. <clears throat> um, and then as far as the actual creek itself, um, this is where we'd be looking to do more of the work because my, um, you know, my program is really um, invested in aquatic habitat. Um, we think that, you know, Schwabenon Creek actually has um, one of the greatest potential, um, is one of the greatest potential sites in the area that I work in to try to reestablish native mussels, these little guys. Um, they're one of the most imperiled groups globally. Um, and we've done some studies um, over the last couple of years that show that a Schwabenon Creek is actually probably one of the best places to try to get them reestablished. So one of the ways you do that is you just drop, you know, they like this little cobbly um, habitat. You just drop little rock piles um, that don't impede navigation or anything like that, um, just towards the bottom and then actually stock them. Um, <clears throat> and these are also uh, usually really nice habitat for sunfishes. So like smallmouth bass really like them, um, um, pumpkin, pumpkin seeds, things that people like to fish for in general. Um, another thing that we really think would be great is um, some additional woody habitat um, within either the creek or actually along the adjacent Fox River shoreline for um, catfish specifically, but also some yellow perch, um, northern pike, muskie, that kind of thing. 
Um, and then that's kind of it for Schwabenon Creek and Ashwaubenon Park. Um, Dutchman Creek is a really similar project to the Ashwaubenon Creek um, project we'd be doing, you know, looking to do some really similar stuff as far as in water work and then just sort of small improvements to the shoreline. Um, looking to maybe, you know, the landowner here is um, the city of Green Bay and then off to this side is um, Brown County. <clears throat> so we'd be working, you know, with them um, pretty heavily on um, what that project would look like. But because, you know, um, of the footprint, I just wanted to make sure that that was something that, you know, the village was aware of as well. So um, that's pretty much what I have to talk about with the projects. Um, I figured there might be some questions about, you know, how we get these projects funding or funded, excuse me. Um, DNR works with EPA to um, get non-competitive funding um, through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative um, to implement these different projects. Um, I will be working with several project partners um, now through the end of December and even into January, February to submit proposals to get um, planning and design funds for a subset of these 18 projects. And then, you know, we'd also be looking to solicit contributions from other funding sources like NRDA. Um, and then we often pass through those funds once we are able to obtain them to, you know, the local unit of government um, landowners to actually administer that project. So, you know, sending things up to bid and providing that oversight. Um, so that's kind of like the, um, the arrangement that would be really um, quite typical of how we've done work in other areas of concern like Marinette and Sheboygan. So um, that's pretty much it. Um, I guess I'll pause for a second and see if there's any questions. So the village runs the projects and the DNR oversees them. They fund them, they, they, get, they supply the funding for the projects as well? Yep, um, so GLRI requires no, technically the focus area of GLRI that we get this money from um, requires no cost share. Um, any kind of cost share, you know, even if it's through in kind, um, really goes a long way for us to sort of um, nudge EPA to get us that um, funding. So, you know, like Rex said, you know, administering the project, that's a big, um, that shows commitment through like the village that, you know, you guys are really um, behind the project. You're really interested in getting it done, maintaining it um, in sort of the longer term. Um, but yeah, essentially DNR passes through the funding to Village of Ostrobanon. Um, and, you know, my role at that point is really to serve as one of the technical experts to make sure that we're ticking off the boxes of my program, but also that we're um, abiding by the sort of the federal and state um, funding roles. So no funding, the village isn't on the hook for funding the projects as well, just administration. Nope. Any, I mean, anything that uh, the village could contribute certainly um, is um, a good thing, but no, technically the village is not on the hook for funding. I will say that, um, you know, working through long-term maintenance is going to be an important part of the story to tell, um, you know, to get this funding is having something in place that says like, hey, if EPA helps, you know, uh, send you right money down to the village of Ashwaban and there's some assurance that you know the work that's being done is going to be maintained in some way um, for the Ashwaban Park project I think that mostly you know the um, the onus would probably be on the village to you know maintain the actual Ashwaban Park elements but as far as what's happening in the creek you know we'd want to sort of design those out so that they really didn't require any maintenance and if they did that would be something that's a little bit more in the wheelhouse of you know, DNR and some of the other um, agencies to help maintain if need be. I'll use an example for the last GLRI NRDA project. <clears throat> we did the buckthorn removal uh, along the western shoreline, quite a bit in the woods there. We just completed um, our, 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 our a new spraying uh, to try and knock down the regrowth. As part of the grant uh, that we worked with with Stantec that helped that we helped administer it together. Um, I want to say there were three initial sprayings of the buckthorn once the buckthorn was cut down, um, and then it would be on the village to try and, and try and maintain it and keep that up. And we just uh, completed our first uh, sp complete spraying of the woods over the course of the last couple of weeks. So it's that type of thing. It, it, it's not a it's not a heavy duty type of maintenance that we have to do, but it is it is something you know ongoing that we need to take a look at. But it's certainly doable, um, and and that's where. I would come in as the director is working with Brianna, uh, taking a look at the projects, find out what projects are going to be most beneficial in terms of not having to do a lot of long-term maintenance, but still meets some of the goals and responsibilities that the DNR is trying to achieve. 
Rex, is there any estimated time that you're looking at that this will move ahead? Um, I'm guessing that uh, I'll, I'll let Bree answer that actually because I don't know what the grant timeline process is. Yeah, so um, we're, we're going to be pretty, um, we're wanting to be pretty aggressive with our timeline um, for getting these projects done just because of um, some of the federal um, goals and objectives for this funding. Um, so we want to try to have all these projects implemented by 2024 which would mean that, you know, for some of these projects like this one that are maybe just a little bit more complex, um, you know, we'd want to try to get them planned and designed out over the next year. And then we'd be, you know, then going back to EPA and after they're planned and designed out and saying, hey, we want the money to actually implement them now. Um, and that would be, you know, over the next couple of years. Um, and then with each of these projects that we've managed, we always build in a three-year monitoring and maintenance period into that grant also. So you do have... Um, some funds to actually, you know, complete some maintenance work um, over a short term. And then after that, you know, um, example, I uh, work with the city of Marinette, you know, they um, did some monitoring maintenance through that existing grant. And then we uh, worked with one of the local invasive species groups to keep that invasive species maintenance going um, on some of the projects that we have up there. Is there any, uh, any, way that the village employees get involved in that or is this all hired out through another uh, company? Well, it, it would really depend, yeah, it, it would really depend on what the, what the, when Bree and I and, and it would come up with our initial project list it would depend on what that project list is and, and what the skill set and time commitment of, of the village employees would be. I don't think there's any doubt that the village wants to try and help out on stuff like this, um, but we are quite honestly a, a kind of a lean and mean, you know, staffing wise in, in terms of, I don't know how much time we could give into the project other than some of the, the long-term maintenance, you know, the ongoing, like what, what I talked about before with the spring, but an actual, um, actually, actually helping construct something like this, it, it, it takes a, it takes quite a bit of manpower to get you know some of these projects built in and of itself, Gary. And I don't know if that's where you're going with this, but it, I, I'd say it would be tough for us to other other than you know ancillary help of you know maybe a few things. I, I don't think we would be the ones able to construct things like that time-wise, not with the not with the workload we already have. That that's what the grant funds would be for, and and, and and the project would be bid out for someone to be able to do that. Just to piggyback on that a little bit, um, was that I was going to ask a similar question, um, Bree? How much um, input would Rex have to implement this program? Um, so he sees fit that that we can fit it into. Um, so we're not we're not stressing our staff here. Yeah, um, that's a great question. One that we run into really frequently, even when it comes to just, you know, even if it's not constructing the project, which most, um, you know, most municipalities and things like that don't usually have the capacity to do the actual construction work. Um, it's usually sort of that administration um, side of things. So, you know, he and I will work together over the next couple of months to even just make sure that that administration side of things is covered. Um, if it feels like, you know, we're getting through things and he's like, man, I just, I don't know that we have enough staff time for this. You know, we often build capacity into these grants to help, you know, pay for some time. Um, you know, if that, if that capacity isn't already existing, even for just the administration part of it. So they'll have a lot of say um, in that, of course. I think the other thing too, um, a concern that I initially had and, and still do somewhat when talking with Bree, is just the long-term ramifications of each project. Uh, I don't want to paint the village of Eshwaban on into any corner by having a project done and then 10 or 20 years down the road say to ourselves, well, I'd really like to change this or I'd really like to change that, but we can't change it because now that project's in that area and that's kind of locked in there for the next 50 years type of thing. I think the projects that Bree and I would need to 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 agree upon and, and work on over the next couple months, if, if this were to go forward, would be ones that we would feel fairly comfortable about. You know, long term, that there there would be no 
ramifications of, of, of us needing to do any changing or repurposing areas of the park in the future. Because one, once you do a project like this, you know, in 10 years, you can't say, well, I want to take this, this meadow and, and turn it into a, 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 a picnic area. Well, then you've got to like literally pay back those funds that were used to make that meadow. And, and the village doesn't want to have to do that. So I think, you know, work, Bree and I working together, we need to be, you know, open with each other and, and, and just cautious on, on what projects are there and, 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 and making sure that the village is not going to have, and not going to second guess itself a few years down the line of, well, why did we do that type of a thing? So on that, if, if we would approve this, Today, tonight, are we locking ourselves in into something similar to that? Are we locking ourselves into what they want to do? No, nothing's been set in stone. I mean, it, Bri Brianna has talked about some of the projects that, that are on their list. And I think what would probably happen, Brianna, and you can kind of, you know, respond to this after I say it, is we would kind of lock down what projects I think the village felt comfortable with. I would probably bring those back at another village board meeting and, and just say, okay, here's what we have decided upon, you know, and everyone can take a look at it with, you know, a fresh set of eyes and, and, and to see if there's any potential concerns that anyone has, you know, long term of any of these individual projects. Okay, so th this would go in steps then. We're not, so right. along the way we'd be approving. Yeah, I, I think what, what this just kind of gives you the permission to, hey, let's go ahead and, and to, to work with Bree to work and, and, and see where and this say goes. In, in some form or capacity, the village is willing and wanting to work with the DNR on these projects, but all of these projects will come back to you in, in final form, bef okay. you know, before they actually have wheels. Right. Okay. Bree, does that sound? Yeah. Yep. These are 100% just, these are just 100% concepts. Nothing at all is um, locked in. And I would say, you know, even beyond you know, I expect even beyond just talking with the board, you know, that we're going to have, you know, some conversations maybe with, you know, some of the community that, you know, adjacent landowners around that um, area, private landowners that probably would like to have a say also. We want to make this as um, sort of successful as possible. We don't want anybody to feel like it's being, you know, um, kind of done to them, right? Um, so, yeah, this is 100% conceptual at this point and is going to continue to go through these steps of, you um, you know, meeting with the village board and um, me and Rex working together to make sure that, you know, it is um, ticking our boxes and making sure that you guys are comfortable with it as well. Brianna, what, what specifically are you looking for from our village board this evening? What I think just exactly what you had said, you know, um, I just want to make sure that, you know, the village board is aware that um, this is something that, you know, you and I have talked about and that we'd like to kind of move forward with continuing to refine what those concepts look like. Um, I will be submitting um, proposals, as I said, for, you know, a subset of these projects. I would like to submit a proposal for going through that planning and design phase that will help refine those project concepts um, to EPA in um, sort of that December timeframe. So that's just sort of a heads up, you know, um, I'm applying for it. It would be passed through down to the village of Ashwaban, you know, if we were to get that funding this year. Um, so we want to make sure that, you know, if I'm applying for that funding with EPA and we're telling them we're just going to pass it through the village of Ashwaban that everybody's okay with that, you know, kind of moving forward over the next year of going through that sort of refinement of these concepts. I'm a long-term grants and program person. This is the very first step. There's no commitment. At some point, you'll write a letter of commitment saying if the funds are granted, you'll accept that. I'll make the motion to go ahead and, and uh, get this started. I would second that. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to move forward with um, the uh, DNR and Village of Ashwabden in partnership to get these projects started. Any more discussion? No. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you, Bree. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me again. Have a good night. You too. Okay, 9C, action on request for resubmitted site plan review for Hinkle Field screening. Mr. Aaron Schutte. This is a uh, requested resubmittal uh, from the village board meeting uh, back in July from the Green Bay Packers to uh, install a 
screening uh, methodology along uh, Armed Forces Drive. Uh, currently, there is the uh, chain link fence that provides screening uh, as well as the uh, material they put over the uh, back of it to screen views uh, during practices on Hinkle Field. Uh, with the construction of the Expo Center uh, and the second floor uh, patio uh, porch area providing views uh, over the top of that screening, uh, the Packers are concerned that uh, it can basically provide uh, insight into their uh, play calling plays for uh, for their their team. Uh, at the last meeting, uh, there was a concern from the board members regarding uh, the poles that will be used to uh, raise and lower the screening to the 33-foot height uh, for the screening necessary to, uh, I guess, block the views from the Expo Center. Uh, the Packers have resubmitted some uh, new uh, renderings uh, depicting the screening. Uh, as well as the poles, uh, primarily looking from uh, heading north up South Oneida Street, uh, as well as then a rendering from the uh, patio, uh, or second floor of the Expo Center. Uh, Aaron Popke of the Packers is here in the audience. Do you have questions for him? Uh, otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions for you as well. I, I um, um, oh, go ahead, Gary. Go ahead, Mary, you, you and I are on the Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, so what they did is they uh, superimposed some poles into the area on the practice field that these poles would be sitting. And I think it's a better depiction of what's going to be there. And mm -hmm. the screening will not be up what, Aaron, you and I talked about that, maybe two to three hours at a time, maybe three to four days a week. So... Um, that would be the only time it would be up, and other than that, that's all you'd see is is the the poles. And I don't think you can really tell the difference between the poles and the light poles that are there. So, um, is there going to be any decorative lights on top of these, Aaron? Could you state your name and address for the record, please? Uh, Aaron Popke, uh, Green Bay Packers, uh, twelve sixty five Lombardi Avenue. I think our, at the last meeting where we discussed this, I think we, uh, right now the plan is not to have anything, but we left open the possibility if there was some other decorative piece. And we talked about maybe making them look more like flagpoles, that sort of thing. But right now I think the the discussion was just to give a better depiction of what they look like. And I would say now too, getting a better visual <clears throat> from like across the street, I didn't even realize the one where you can see like everything basically. I didn't even realize that the poles were superimposed until I looked at it a second or third time. Um, now seeing the height of them compared to the one that we saw from the Steelers, I don't even think, I mean flags, I, they'd be low, flags would be low on these poles I feel like. So I'm pleased with the renderings, I, it gives a better picture. So. Yeah, I think uh, Mary said, um, well, the, the pictures and the other pictures that were in the packet, they, you can see the, the facade of the, the Resch Expo. I mean, you, from the van, one vantage point, you kind of lose the poles in the facade. And to the point Mary made, the, the screens would actually just come up during practice, which, you know, for instance, this week would be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for a max of about two hours a day. And I think if we came to a, uh, we'd be working with the Resch Expo team as well, just to confirm when and if people would actually be in there. So that could be another possibility as well. So really just to minimize when the screens would go up. And we understand that's, uh, that is what we're, we're discussing here today, just having the, the sight lines blocked and those types of things. And the one depiction you can see, uh, they, you know, the height wise would be enough to really just block the field you know, if you were at that second level of the Rush Expo. Yeah, someone last time, the last go around on this, that somebody was, that I was personally just uh, not happy at all with it. These angles are, make way more sense. Okay. You know, I, I don't have an issue with this at all. The last, last pictures that were taken, like from the, it just didn't make sense to me, but this is much better. Yeah, our, our goal would be to minimize how often you know, they're up in the, the position. 
the tour we had today tonight um we were up on that deck gary myself mike and when we looked down upon that uh, you realized that it was really quite inconsequential um, in compared to all the massive infrastructure that's there and i'm not saying the massive infrastructure isn't nice it, it is excellent but just i just using that as an example that uh, the the poles there you're really not going to notice them you're not going to notice them and for the the amount of time that they're going to be actually used for screening is nominal in nature as well. Uh, going along with what Steve said, uh, being up on that second tier this evening, uh, I uh, I would not like seeing. And uh, first of all, I thought the lighting uh, mech would be kind of cool, lighting up that area. But the more we put on those poles, the worse the the worse they're going to hang out. Uh, so I think keeping the poles as simple as possible is the best way to, hiding is not the right word, but just to make them not as noticeable. Um, I, I, I checked with our uh, Doug Martin and uh, got some numbers on some light poles, which you see a light pole in this picture here. And I, if I remember right, Doug says they're in the area of 40 plus feet. So. The light poles are a little taller than the uh, poles that they're uh, putting along that line there, although there's a number more than the, than the uh, few light poles along there. But, uh, you know, the NFL has got a problem with sneaky people, and I can understand the Packers situation. Uh, I, 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 it, it's something you, you don't like, but you got to go along with the trend. We got to, we got to help our neighbors, uh, they help us out very well econ or, uh, with uh, their football team here, the economy they bring into the area. Uh, my only only thing I have to say is, if you got to fence it, I don't mind it, but I don't want to see them fences up no more than what I see a football player on that field. That would be the maximum time. And I don't want to see them rolled up hanging on the fence that it's something that is not maintained. Uh, I'm sure you people have pride in the way your uh, facility looks and I'm sure you'll go along with that. So if there's no other questions, I'll move to approve the project as the Packers presented it with the uh, black poles and keep it as simple as possible. I'll second. Okay, a motion and a second to approve the resubmitted site plan review for Hinkle Field screening. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. All right. Aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, Aaron. 9D, discussion and possible action on the appointment process to fill the pending vacancy of the Office of Trustee for Wards 11 and 12. So, Trustee Mike Malcheski is moving back to his hometown where there's winter seven months out of the year. <laughs> Don't know how you ever convinced Sometimes Fran more. to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's been a great pleasure to work with you, Mike. He's served the village well. He's represented the people from 11 and 12 wards very, very well through the years. Um, so we will have to make the decision of if we're going to um, appoint, like we did for 9 and 10 last month, take applications and appoint or leave it open. But leaving it open, Tony and I discuss that, that's seven months, that's a pretty long time, so. Do we need Madam uh, President, I don't think there's no decision here other than we will fill that with yeah. do we need whoever to make a motion? is qualified. Okay, so take do the applications on like we did for wards nine and 10? Mm -hmm. I need a motion and a second on that. I'll move that we Posted and get applications for trustee wards 11 and 12 no and second. appoint it. No second. Okay, and then the, do we have to put in there that the appointment, they have to be in by October 21st? Add that to my motion. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion and a second for that appointment process. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Sorry. That was an aye. You were an aye. Yeah. Okay. Okay, 9F, discussion and possible action on, whoop, nope, sorry. 
9E, discussion and possible action on the appointment process to fill the pending vacancy of the Office of Trustee for Ward 7 and 8. So Trustee Mark Williams is going to be moving out of Ward 7 and 8, and he can no longer represent the people in the, those wards. So what would you like to do with this? Appoint. I, I make a motion we do the same thing as what we did with 11 and 12 by opening it up to the persons who are willing to serve on the board and the best one get the appointment. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second to do the same process for seven and eight that we're doing for 11 and 12. By the way, I'm not moving out of the area to where it's winter seven months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> I am moving into the village and just relocating, so. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, 9F. Discussion and possible action on the village clerk job description and job posting. Tony. This agenda item is a follow-up to the uh, charter ordinance that was uh, passed uh, uh, back this summer as a result of the referendum question on uh, transferring or, or changing the clerk treasurer position from an elected to an appointed position. Uh, so what this does is revi revise the job description to be consistent with that and make some other uh, cleanup changes uh, for clarity purposes. Uh, it's expected that the current village clerk will vacate the position in, uh, on January 4th, 2021. And uh, the, um, there will be a vacancy then in the clerk position. Uh, and as a result to, to start the process now so we can, we can fill that position in time and, and uh, ideally make an appointment, uh, presumably at the December board meeting so that individual would have some time to spend with the current clerk and job shadowing and things of that nature. Uh, so this again just uh, begins the process with revising the job description and uh, authorizing posting and moving forward with the hiring process. This went through finance and personnel and uh, we made some minor changes, but or one minor change I believe but uh, all in all, it uh, depicts what we've set as charter ordinance, I guess, for and what the village residents voted for back last April. So um, I'll make a motion that we approve the village clerk job, revised job description and begin the hiring process. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second discussion. Um, question. Uh, I think our uh, finance and personnel committee do a great job. I got a lot of respect for our village clerk, who uh, I'm uh, hoping that he was involved in this process of uh, putting this together, uh, knowing the positions that he's been filling here since he's been in the village uh, role. So if that is fine, I got no other questions. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 9G, action on ordinance 09-2-20, amending Ashwabna Municipal Code section 4-1-4 regarding number of pigeons allowed. Tony. <laughs> The proposed uh, ordinance uh, is an amendment which essentially would set a limit for the amount of pigeons uh, that may be kept at a property. This issue arose when public safety had received a complaint uh, regarding a number of pigeons that were kept at a property. Uh, as a result of that, in discussion with public safety and review of the ordinance, uh, we discovered that there was no cap as far as the specific number of pigeons. Uh, so after performing uh, some uh, research with respect to uh, a cap number for surrounding municip municipalities, uh, 12 or a dozen seem to be the uh, consistent uh, number amongst other areas. And so what this does is uh, sets a number for the amount of pigeons that can be allowed at a property, as well as grandfathering any current use or permits uh, until those are terminated. 
A uh, question that was brought up, I believe, at uh, one of the committees. 12 fidgets, I don't have a problem. I think the number of permits was the question. Uh, are we going to go along with the same number as we do with the chickens? Yes. Uh, four permits? Yes. Okay. Is that, I, I'm not reading that in here, or am I overlooking it? I don't. I think, uh, I think that's something we wanted in this. Uh, New ordinance. I don't see it. No, that limit is not in there. So if you just add that in there, make an amendment to a uh, to the ordinance and approve as amended, that would be appropriate? Yes. Okay. So moved. Oh. So you're going to make that motion, Steve? Yes, ma'am. Which, which, section, which section of the ordinance? You can go with section A. So. You could put it anywhere in A, really, really Tony, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, did you second that, Gary? Yes, I did. Okay, so there is a motion and a second to approve with the amendment of limiting it to four. Now Patrick has the um, written communication that goes with this also. Uh, I received an email this very morning from Holly Gladowski, uh, a Schwabenon resident, and it reads as follows. Hello, my name is Holly Gladowski. I reside at, uh, on Morris Avenue. I'm concerned about the number of birds you are going to allow in the city with a permit. This is my second year with my permit, and as far as I know, of the only complaint was a person that lives in, what well, they put Green Bay, but I'm assuming Ashwaubenon, and never even saw my coop. I have been working towards flying my birds, and this will not be possible with such a small number. Please take this in consideration when rewriting this. And... Uh, She's listening in to the meeting tonight, where so stated. Thank you for your time. Okay. Um, so if I may, before you take the vote, Madam President, so motion by Trustee Kabaki uh, to amend portion A of the ordinance, and that should read how? To limit to four permits. In the entire village. Limit of four permits. Yes. Thank Just you. like the chickens. Okay, thank you. It's four permits within the village, but then are we limiting the amount of pigeons that that permit allows? 12, no. 12 pigeons 12. per 12. permit. Yeah, so 12 per pigeons per permit. Per permit. 12 per yes. permit. Yes, four total, okay. Yes. You know, I kind of get that, you know, as far as pigeons goes. I mean, the only guy that I know that raises pigeons or, or the only person are people that train hunting dogs. They use them They use them for, you know, retrieving an, a live bird and everything when they, when you're, when you shoot and retrieve and stuff like that. They don't kill the birds. They just, they can tie their wings up so that they can't fly. Um, I don't know if you can have six female pigeons and six male pigeons and, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, you're going to have more at some point in time, no matter what. But you can go through a few pigeons by doing that, too. So I don't know what she uses them for, but, I mean, I don't know if 12 is the magic number or what the magic number is supposed to be. Well, I don't either, but I know that at Public Works, um, the, it was checked around that, and that's the average number of what most of the municipalities have is 12. So that's why we went with 12. So there is other municipalities that have pigeon restrictions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know if the resident in my ward in 12 has birds anymore. Yes, he does. He does. Okay. Yes. I talked Perhaps. with Bob. Oh, he did? Okay. Mm -hmm. But for several years, he would use them at weddings and funerals and things like that. And I would see him circling. He'd probably fly him every third day for maybe 20 minutes just to exercise him. And then they'd be back. 
in, back in their coops. Right. Um, I, ta I talked to Bob about it. He has white pigeons that he uses yeah. for funerals and weddings, and yep. then he has other pigeons that he uses um, for people with training dogs. How many does he have? I don't know, but um, him, anybody who has a permit and anybody who has them now would be grandfathered into this. But they'd have to still maintain our limits here. They will have to, once they get down to 12, they would have to, yes. He is, he is actually, he told me that he's getting older and he's not getting new pigeons, so. Mm. Okay. Anyway. He may have more than 12, but he has grandfathered in. Correct. That's what right. it comes down to. Correct. As would and he was on Sand Acres and that was, yeah. that was negotiated way back when, when that area was annexed. Right. Uh, and we, he came forward on that, and at that particular point in time, we thought that that was only when we knew of pigeons in, in the entire area, and we were going into a more rural area there, yeah. uh, agricultural area, that, and we thought it would be appropriate to grandfather him in. Right. So does this other lady that you just mentioned on the letter? She is grandfather. Okay. She has a permit also. So. Okay. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 9H, action on ordinance number 9-3-20, repealing and recreating Ashwaubenon Municipal Code, section 2-8-768, regarding abandoned or unclaimed property. The proposed ordinance uh, essentially repeals and recreates our current section so that it is more consistent with the requirements of the state statute with respect to abandoned unclaimed property or lost uh, and unclaimed property. So essentially what we're doing by adopting this ordinance is to allow public safety to have other methods of disposal uh, other than at a public auction. Uh, the state statute requires us to adopt an ordinance uh, to dispose of property in, in a manner other than just an auction. And so what this ordinance would allow public safety to do, uh, or the village uh, in general, is to dispose of property that comes into possession of uh, by either donation, diversion, destruction, uh, or a public auction. Uh, this was brought up at plan board. Uh, we discussed the room it takes for storing all these things they collect. Uh, it gets to be an expense when you run out of room on your own property and you've got to store them on some rented property. I believe Green Bay, like I said before, had problems with this. Uh, I think it's a good way for us to go uh, and get rid of this stuff after 90 days if nobody comes around in that period of time. Uh, they don't want it anymore. So I don't know, Chief, if you've got something to add to this. Tony covered it pretty well. Uh, we just want to make sure that we're following statute so we have uh, the opportunity to um, look at other ways to dispose of the property that we come in contact with, especially abandoned property. So um, anything else? Uh, again, we just want to make sure we're complying with state statutes. So. Move to approve ordinance 09-3-20. Second. Motion and a second to approve ordinance number 09-3-20. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion carried. 9-I, action on ordinance 09-4-20, repealing and recreating Ashwaubenon Municipal Code, section 3-2-110, social host ordinance. Again, another ordinance cleanup. This one is with respect to uh, the, our social host ordinance, which is also maybe more frequently or better known as contributing to the delinquency of a minor uh, as far as providing alcohol. Uh, our current ordinance uh, is out of compliance with respect to uh, an appeals court case that came down uh, more specifically with respect to Fond du Lac County's social host ordinance, which was essentially the same as ours. And that ordinance was uh, declared improper and, and uh, contrary to Chapter 125, which is the state law concerning alcohol licensing. And so what this does is revise our ordinance so it's consistent with that appeals court case. 
uh, which essentially requires that there be some sort of uh, specific knowledge on behalf of the adult uh, and then failing to take any sort of action to prevent the consumption of, on, of underage drinking uh, or to specifically with knowledge provide uh, alcohol to underage persons and it also revises the penalty section so that it's consistent with chapter 125. Move to approve ordinance 09-4-20. Second. Motion and a second to approve ordinance 09-4-20. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. 9J, action on resolution to apply for DNR recreational fishing pier grant funding. Rex. All right, as uh, most of you know, we are looking at expanding the Ashwaba May River Trail to the south. Uh, currently, uh, the southern portion of it ends at the Bay Harbor Condominium Complex. Uh, we're in the process of expanding that around the Alden Station uh, housing development. Um, the next phase would be a pedestrian bridge that goes from Alden Station uh, across the mouth of Ashwabame, or excuse me, Ashwabanon Creek into Ashwabame Park. Um, there is potential to get some funding uh, from the DNR uh, in the sports fish restoration grant. It would help us pay for a portion of the bridge as well as a fishing bump out that would be on the bridge itself. Um, to do that, we need a resolution um, such as you have in front of you this evening stating that the village um, has the funds to do that. Um, as you know, the village uh, a couple months ago gave the go-ahead for us to work with Grape Architects on the design of the bridge and that is, that is rolling right now. Um, but to apply for the grant, we need um, you know, something stating that uh, we're moving forward with the project and that we're in support of applying for the grant. I'll move to approve the resolution to apply for the DNR Recreational Fishing Pier Grant. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve resolution to apply for DNR Recreational Fishing Pier Grant. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. 9K, update on village manager hiring process. So um, it's been out on the, on the web and we've gotten applications. Our next step is to have some phone interviews um, and whittle it down to maybe uh, six or eight. And then there will be a team of myself, de depart certain department heads, a board member from finance and personnel to whittle it down from there and the next interview will be two teams that will be a combination of village board and department heads. And then that will bring it down to two and that will go in front of village board for the final. So um, we have to, we've been discussing because now for the month of October, we will be down to five trustees. So we don't wanna create a quorum with with village board members, so we have to get that figured out. But it will be one one person from finance and personnel. That's a, a board member. So. How are the applications coming in? Good, I believe we have 21 in the qualified. Is, mm -hmm. who's reviewing those 21? Is it Tony and you or? Uh, Tony and myself, and then Aaron, Doug, and Greg. And you guys are all agreeing on who we're going to interview then? Yeah, pretty much. It's it's kind of been when we rated them. So, yeah. So, any more discussion on that? Very good. Okay. Information. 9L, review and approval of agreement for purchase of capacity in Dutchman Creek Interceptor Sewer with the Green Bay Metropolitan Sewage District. Oh, hot dog. Whoa. That was a lot to say. I'll keep it as uh, brief <laughs> as possible, but I'll give you a little geography lesson along, along the way. Um, just to kind of familiarize yourself, uh, in the village, if you divide us by Highway 41 and 172, the northeast quadrant of the village, so where we sit right now, this, in, this entire northeast quadrant of the village drains 
uh, the wastewater drains through a collector sewer, heads down to Lombardi Avenue, uh, right in front of Fort Howard, and goes then all the way to the treatment plant at the mouth of the Fox River, the, the new water treatment facility. The other three quarters of the village is served by two main interceptor sewers, one of them being the Dutchman Creek interceptor sewer, which is the one we'll be talking about tonight. That serves kind of the central portion of the village and goes out into Howard and the Ashwaubenon Creek interceptor sewer that comes out of the, both of these come out of the De Pere treatment plant and uh, the Ashwaubenon Creek one heads south uh, through the Creek Way that's uh, along Glory Road, along Spirit Way and heads out through the Sand Acres neighborhood and goes out into the village of, uh, the town of Lawrence, excuse me. Uh, back when the village was growing uh, in 1999, the Ashwaubenon Creek interceptor sewer was constructed and upsized to provide capacity for us to serve the industrial park and all of the development at the south end of the village. Uh, that was on a 20, 20 year note. Uh, that last payment came due uh, this past year and is now paid off. The, Ash the uh, Dutchman Creek interceptor sewer has um, some rehabilitation that's required and a slight capacity upgrade uh, of which the, uh, the village would have a portion, the sewer utility would have a portion of that payment. Uh, this originally started, I think, three years ago and was in the budget process. It was about $105,000. Uh, there were some DNR issues that uh, the Met had to work through uh, in completing the design and getting it out for bid. Uh, so that was finalized this past winter, uh, put out for bid this past spring, and started construction about a, about a month ago. As you drive down Hanson Road, they were just crossing Hanson Road today with that construction. Uh, with it being bid, uh, with the final numbers coming through, that $104,000 number dropped down to about 89000 That would be out of a $3.3 .3 million project, that's the portion that would be tied to the village sewer utility, the capacity we, we would have to buy for our, for our operations. Um, with the payments I was discussing that uh, just wrapped up with the uh, Ashwaubenon Creek Interceptor Sewer, this payment would fall right in line. We would budget for it next year. It'd be a one-time payment, not spread over 20 years. Uh, wouldn't have an impact on our rates and uh, is part of the agreement that's before you tonight for review and approval. So are they gonna re rehabilitate that area? Because they cut one heck of a swat through there. Uh, Mark, you had contacted me a couple of weeks ago on that. I provided you the contact information for them. Yeah. Uh, they have easement through there uh, to conduct their work. I know I discussed it with them. Uh, you had mentioned it, I think. Uh, we got two other phone calls from people asking if they could put plantings, say, on the roadsides, like at Hanson Road and things like that, to discourage people to go through. I know they're looking into it. Um, but full plantings throughout, when they contacted each of the property owners, some property owners requested different things as part of granting or re-granting the easements. And uh, I, I don't have information on that, unfortunately, as it's a, as it's a Green Bay Met project but I've been passing along each of the comments that come through our office to them to come, reach out and talk to those property owners. Doug, uh, I've, been, I've been talking to a couple of people around the Swan uh, Court area back and through there. <clears throat> They've been talking about this for some time. How come we're just finding out about it at the village board level? Is that a fair answer? If you remember two years ago, this came through uh, the budget process. We brought it through last year. There was a, a two year delay as they completed all of their DNR paperwork. Uh, we actually had meetings here, I wanna say three years ago that kicked this off. Okay. So this document came, came before you last year. Uh, the issue is it had to get rewritten because of some of the changes some of the cost adjustments that were made due to the DNR, uh, uh, I don't wanna say paperwork, but DNR requirements they had to change. And then once they bid it out, then they were able to get this final paperwork to us. Okay, the, the, so basically what it's doing is just taking care of the capacity that's needed right now, is that simple terms? Correct. Okay, Correct. All, right. all right, then I can answer a question. Yep, that's one of the unfortunate things is when this originally started, there was a rollout on, on all of it they got so far, the DNR kicked in with a couple of items. So it spanned the course of a number of years, spanned two budget seasons for us. And so it just, it seems like it's been since forever since we've discussed this. Okay, thank you. Yep. 
So the Met Metropolitan Sewage District is responsible for the uh, signings of all the easements and everything that go through there. That that's correct. Yeah, our, our sewers flow. What happens if they don't have any signed agreements? I believe they do, Mark. Uh, I know some people that had problems with them agreements. Uh, it just so happened that one of the parties that uh, I know the son works for the state and he over, he looked at those agreements and they were so far outdated that they really had to revive their agreement. They got to bring their agreements up to date so the people understood them. So there was a problem there for a while. I'll have to call that guy then because I don't, rem I don't remember ever seeing one. It goes right through my new backyard, Gary, so I know where it is. Yep, by all, by all means, Bob Brown, or the gentleman that I provided the contact information for you. Yep. That's who you'd want to discuss it with. But okay. the easements, they, they wouldn't be able to go through those areas without signed easements, yep. but by all means, okay. contact them regarding it. Okay. If you need the contact information again, just let me know. Okay, thanks. So we need a motion to approve the agreement? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agreement for the purchase of capacity in Dutchman Creek Interceptor Sewer. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. M, proclamation White Cane Safety Day. This was suggested by the League of Wisconsin Municipalities. A proclamation, White Cane Safety Day. Whereas blindness and severe visual impairment affect approximately 100,000 Wisconsin residents, and whereas those individuals afflicted with blindness and impaired vision are part of our community fabric and should have the means of mobility, self-reliance, and independence, and whereas those visually impaired may utilize travel aids, such as a white cane or service dog, which are universally recognized symbols representing vision loss, and whereas all persons with disabilities should have the same privileges of those without disabilities to safe and functional streets, sidewalks, and public places, and whereas on October 6, 1964, a joint resolution of the United States Congress, H.R. 753, was signed into law authorizing the President of the United States to proclaim October 15th, White Cane Safety Day annually, and whereas President Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the proclamation for annual observance, and now therefore be it resolved, the village of Ashwaubenon does hereby proclaim Thursday, October 15th, 2020, as White Cane Safety Day. Can we just make sure that our next village clerk has like the same radio voice? <laughs> <laughs> I have a face made for radio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's our proclamation. You need a motion on that or not? Motion to receive and place on file. I'll make that. Second. <clears throat> motion and a second to receive and place on file. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Nine and Halloween trick or treat hours. Chief. What's the Halloween trick-or-treat hours this year? 4 p.m. to 7 p.m., as I understand it. Uh, just also want to uh, make sure the residents are aware to use proper precaution when we're doing this. Um, I think the CDC recommends that uh, people maintain a safe distance. Uh, there are options to put their candy out on, uh, you know, the patios or whatever, even individualize them, put them in bags. So. Just want to make sure that they uh, try to do what they can um, when allowing other people that aren't from your household to come up uh, and make sure that they remain safe while doing this. Okay. Thank you. Are we allowed to throw it at them? <laughs> <laughs> projectiles are. I'm going to answer that one. So. <laughs> yeah. We cannot have projectiles. <laughs> okay. 9 0. Action regarding development agreement with merge urban development for building one parcels VA-54-2 and VA-55-A Mike McCarthy Way. Aaron. 
This is the uh, uh, final development agreement uh, with Merge Urban Development. Uh, you may remember we uh, issued an RFP uh, for the Mike McCarthy Way properties owned by the CDA uh, back in May of 2019. Uh, Merge Urban Development responded to the RFP with a pretty comprehensive uh, developed proposal uh, over time for the properties. Uh, over time, we negotiated back and forth uh, with this property, with their development. Uh, initially, they're talking about two buildings. Uh, with the COVID pandemic, that was reduced down to one building. So the proposed development agreement you have before you uh, has been executed by Merge uh, for building one. Uh, this would be on the far west end of the Mark Mike McCarthy Way property uh, on the north side. Uh, so this, the proposal uh, is for roughly 5,000 square feet of uh, first floor leasable, leasable commercial space, uh, 85 residential units uh, for a tax increment uh, of at least $11 million. Uh, to facilitate the project, uh, basically bridge the, uh, the gap that they have in their financing, they are requesting a TIF incentive of uh, $1.75 million uh, over a 15-year period. Uh, in the development agreement, they do have uh, guarantees uh, in there regarding the uh, assessed valuation uh, and payments as is typical with our uh, uh, development agreements. Uh, it's hopeful that this is the first step of a multi-building uh, project uh, for Mike McCarthy Way, and this will really catalyze uh, that area and kind of kick off the redevelopment the village started uh, a few years ago with the purchase of the truck equipment property. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have regarding the uh, development agreement. This has been before us. We've talked about this quite a bit. Yeah. With the development agreement, uh, Aaron, is there any any uh, estimated time when they're going to start? Yes, uh, within the development agreement, uh, they'll be submitting their plans no later than December 31st of this year. So we'll see that at the site plan meeting before the first of the year then? Correct. It'll come, to, I'm sorry, uh, December 31st of, let me clarify that. Uh, construction is to commence no later than November 1st of 2021 uh, with completion by December 31st of 2022. Um, so I believe the plans, and again, it's in the development agreement uh, specifying that date. Uh, I believe it's December 31st of this year, uh, but I'll confirm that uh, in, the, in the agreement. Okay. And just to clarify, since this is within the uh, Sports Entertainment Zoning District, uh, the site plan would come before Site Plan Review Committee, Plan Commission, and Village Board. Mm -hmm. So just so that the public knows, this is a five-story building that's being proposed going on Mike McCarthy. That's correct. So much of the first floor would be commercial uh, to activate the uh, streetscape and then with four stories uh, of residential units, so 85 residential units above that. So it'll be a pretty substantial building. Well, we stuck a lot of money in Mark McCarthy Way and acquiring land down there. It's time we get something going uh, to, uh, to start improving that area that uh, is waiting to be developed. So. No other questions, I'll move to uh, the requirement uh, for the development agreement with MERGE uh, uh, on parcel VA 54-2 and VA 55-A uh, and Mike McCarthy Way. And if I could just add the uh, condition that uh, CDA approves the land sale. Say, okay, there are, okay. Very good, with the approval. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve that agreement with the condition that the CDA approve the land sale. Any more discussion? I, I just have a question, more of a curiosity. Um, they're going to be putting a minimum of 5,000 square feet of leasable, um, I don't know, business or retail. Um, if they stayed at, if they just went with the minimum, what's with the rest of the property would they put up apartments in the conceivably, remaining areas right conceivably they okay. could use that for apartments um okay the problem right now is just the the retail market itself is in such flux right due to covid19 uh amazon so on and so forth that 
Uh, they feel confident in the 5,000 square feet of commercial, uh, but they want to have some flexibility for the remaining square footage. Right, okay. Okay, just a quick point of note as a follow-up in section 2.01, it indicates the plans shall be submitted on or before December 31st of 2020. 2020, sure. Thanks, Tony. Yep. <clears throat> okay, everybody understand the motion? All those in favor say aye. No, aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. 9P, action on health insurance premium forgiveness. Greg. So every year, uh, part of our budgeting process uh, with our health insurance plans is to uh, look at our premiums and oh. set our premiums according um, to our trends of prior years history. We typically try to avoid uh, uh, fluctuations up and down with our premium rates. So we tend to keep them steady. And one of the, the budgeting tools that we use is if we have a good year in our plan, well, we can, because we're self-funded, we can uh, forgive premiums towards the end of the year to, um, to address any uh, surplus within the fund. This year, it uh, seems like everything else has been bad, but in, in the health insurance for our, our business, or for, for, our, for the village, uh, we've been doing very well. And so we are looking at a, a very strong end to our, our health insurance this year. Uh, it currently has a very strong fund balance in the tune of about $883,000, uh, which is really towards the max of where you want to have a fund balance. So what we're, we're looking to do is to forgive November and December premiums. What that means is it's forgiving both the employer and employee portion of those premiums. And um, what it, the, the, the double win here is that the benefit to the employees, it's also benefit to the village. And I'll talk in the next couple items about our, our forecast and where we're at. This would be a big plus for our general fund because being self-funded, we charge back to the, the departments. That's how that fund receives its revenue, it comes back from the, the departments. And then obviously the costs are the, the health insurance costs themselves. Um, again, we've done this over the past few years. It's, it's been a good tool for us. Uh, and it helps us to avoid having a good year and then dropping premiums in the next year and then having a bad year and then raising the premiums again and, and doing that back and forth. So uh, with, with this, we have two plans right now. We have a, a PPO plan and we have an HSA plan. Uh, the PPO plan, the employees uh, pay a premium, so that would be forgiven for them. The HSA employees do not pay a premium, so what we do is we make a contribution to the HSA plan uh, on a comparable basis, so the amount of savings to a single plan on a PPO would be the amount of money contributed to a HSA uh, employee plan. At the end of the day, uh, it's going to, uh, the, this forgiveness in total will be about $228,000 uh, savings to our budget, which is, which is critically needed this year with everything else going on. So uh, this went through finance personnel, they, they approved this. And I'm looking for approval to approve uh, to uh, forgive November and December premiums. With doing this, our plan would still end um, with probably yet a little bit of a, a a surplus. That's how well it's doing. I'll make a motion that we approve the November December medical premium forgiveness as laid out above. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to forgive the premiums for November and December. Any more discussion? This is just a win-win for the general fund uh, yeah. and the employees. And uh, we're very fortunate that the health insurance plan is, is as good as it is right now, or providing those dollars. So it, it came at a very timely man in a timely format, that's for sure. Yeah, it really did. You know, the 2020 budget's tough. So, yeah. Okay. Everybody understand the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 9Q, action on 2021 health insurance option. Right. So like I just mentioned, we currently, the village has and has for a number of years, has two plan options for the employees, uh, a traditional PPL plan and an HSA plan. Uh, we kicked off the HSA plan oh, probably about seven, eight years ago. Oh no, about five years ago. Uh, it's worked out very well. We've had a uh, transition over the years. Three years ago, uh, we have an internal um, health advisory committee, which has representation from all the different employee groups 
within the village. And we have a, a third party consultant as well that helps us through that. And we, uh, we had a plan in place to, to move all employees to the HSA plan uh, by January 1st, 2021, which would be the next budget year. Um, all new employees since I believe uh, January 1st of 2017 have only had the HSA option. So any new employee that comes to Village only goes to the HSA. And last year, if you recall, we came to the board and we offered uh, the same plan and we offered the employees a, an incentive, a contribution to their plans if they made the switch over from the PPO to the, the HSA plan, um, noting that we would not do that going into the 2021 year. Last year we had about, um, you know, about almost 40% of our employees switched from the PPO to the HSA plan. So we had a huge um, transfer over. So what we're looking to do is to continue with that plan and um, offer only the HSA plan for the 2021 budget season going forward. At the end of the day, it's a cheaper plan for the village. It actually saves our budget about $74,000, um, which is again, another helpful uh, piece. But overall, the plan traditionally has done well. And this year, I think that's part of why we have savings this year, um, just the, the different focus on that plan. And I, we think that it drives better consumerism within that plan. I think it's a good plan. I think that uh, the way they laid it out and everything, it really makes sense. So I'll make a motion we approve eliminating the PPO plan health option for the 2021 enrollment. I'll second that. And I and at the at committee, I did ask Mary if there was any feedback one way or another on um, the people that did switch over, employees that did switch over already. And um, she said there was really no no negative feedback at all that she had heard of. Okay. We have a motion and a second to switch and eliminate the PPO plan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. 9R, general fund August year to date financials and 2020 forecast. So it's right. an item that I've traditionally is in the uh, consent agenda, but it's important that this is out to talk and just uh, give you an update where we're at uh, this year. Obviously it has had a lot of, for a lot of people, uh, a lot of budget, budget issues uh, for the village of Eshwabanon and for a lot of municipalities, it really becomes a, a revenue shortage uh, more so than expense. Fortunately, we haven't had any major COVID breakouts um, internally that have driven higher cost uh, other than you know PPE, masks, uh, cleaning supplies. Uh, we, we've, we've been doing well and a lot of those items have been uh, able to be reimbursed through the CARES Act. So uh, we're grateful for that. However, uh, where we've seen some major hits um, are in the revenue side, specifically in some intergovernmental revenues and in room tax revenue, that being one of the largest. Uh, so the forecast here, um, I think the goal for, for, for me has been how do we balance this year? We're gonna have a really difficult budget, um, obviously, as is everybody else. But I feel that we, we have some areas where we can, we can balance the budget. One of those was the premium forgiveness. That's a big piece to help in this. Um, and there are some, a few other areas, of, uh, park and rec, obviously we haven't had programs, but we haven't had the cost, that's kind of a wash. Uh, interest income's been a little bit better than initially thought. I think there's, um, the economy's trying, trying to survive, the market's trying to survive. Uh, but really, and when it comes down to it, there's a lot of uh, lost revenue and I think at the end of the day, uh, we will we'll get there at a zero um, change to budget. That's the plan. Uh, there are a couple other areas. One other area that we, we traditionally can do uh, some things is in our equipment replacement uh, fund. Uh, there's entries at the end of the year. We true that up. We, we make estimates on you know, equipment that we're buying vehicles. And traditionally, they come in a little bit under, so there might be you know, 20, 30,000 savings there. Um, this forecast is showing just over $100,000 uh, a reduction in fund balance. But like I said, we had um, state shared aids, the estimate, the forecast or the uh, revised estimate. They gave us an estimate in the prior October. They gave us revised. That's going to be about 30,000 better than, uh, or 40,000 better than, than, than it originally thought. I think we'll get there uh, at the end of the day. I'm being really, really conservative with room tax numbers and the last two months have been 5,000 higher. So, okay, there's four more months. That's another 20,000. Um, barring any major setbacks with, with COVID, um, I think we'll be okay. But even if we would, our CARES Act uh, allocation from the state is 275,000. Uh, we have really um, submitted about 50,000 in claims total, which includes 
some uh, public safety personnel time, which if you saw an update today that the state uh, tightened the screws on that and then they quickly uh, got a lot of feedback and, and, and scaled back on that. So I think we're gonna be okay uh, getting reimbursed in some of those areas. But we still have over $200,000 available, but we can't use it because we don't have the expenses. It's not, can't be used for lost revenues. I know a lot of legislators and I would encourage you to speak to legislators to continue to, to find a way to get that to be used for lost revenue. And that's, uh, that's the same message by all municipalities across the state uh, because that's where people are suffering. Um, hopefully the state, uh, their hands are tied a little bit because it's federally, federal funds and there's rules around it. But we're still hoping that maybe something could come of that. Um, so at the end of the day, I think, I think we'll be okay. Um, I'm just still being conservative, but there's still you know, four more months to, of, of financials to come through. So um, I'm predicting that we'll, we'll get there. It's just, um, it seems like every week something new comes up. But. Chris, just a quick question. So with that and your predictions and everything through the end of the year, is that assuming, and good thing you're still in the audience, fans are in the stands or is that also is that also being budgeted without that revenue that we normally see from a packer season i, I had this this forecast has you know kind of worst case scenario room tax only because there is no clear message on whether even if there are fans in the stands and um you know from what we can tell it, it could be ten thousand be 20 or 30 maybe at, at max i don't know who knows but wh how many of those people are actually going to be staying in a hotel those mm -hmm. could all be local people so you can't make the assumption that that translates into room tax, no matter how many people are there. Um, there was maybe some thought that people would just come to Green Bay to be close to the action, um, but I don't know if they're, you know, we'll find out uh, when September room tax numbers come in if that's, if that's true or not, if the hotels were, were sold out for just people wanting to get away from home and just be close to Green Bay for the games. I, I don't know. Um, and that's what a lot of the unknown questions are. And so because of that, I took the more conservative approach said, yeah, let's just go with a really small number. Okay, thank you. You know, I think if we'd get a word from one of the people from the Packers here on when they're gonna open up the games to the <laughs> public, we could understand how room tax would increase. Yeah, we all want to see fans in the stands. On kind of an unre well, related and unrelated note, so we had our first home game. Um, Chief, did you experience, you know, down in that area, any major concerns? You know, I, I personally wasn't down there, so. No, uh, no major concerns. I actually went down there myself uh, right around kickoff. Uh, kind of looked at the entertainment district. There wasn't a whole lot of people down there. Okay. I thought Stadium View had quite a few, had a decent crowd in their outdoor area, but the other establishments really didn't. There weren't that many people walking around. As I drove around the neighborhoods, there really weren't that many people that were doing tailgating, that type of thing. So it was, it was. Uh, I would imagine this is my first year here, so this is new for me, but talking to the other folks, it's uh, it was a bit surreal knowing that there was a game going on in Lambeau and hardly anybody around. Okay. Yeah, you know when there's people around versus when there aren't for a Packer game. So good okay. to know, thank you. Okay, any more questions on the forecast? Okay, moving on to 9S, Action on Audit Services RFP. Great. Uh, the village uh, is due for uh, an, an RFP for our audit services. We've been using um, formerly Shank, now uh, Clifton, Larson, Allen, CLA uh, for, boy, it's been well over 20 years. Um, the last couple of years, uh, service has been noticeably different with the transfer to CLA. And this year kind of kind of came to a head. I've noticed that, uh, I talked to a lot of my colleagues in the area who have similar experiences. So I got to thinking, uh, okay, it's probably time to do an RFP. I made some phone calls uh, to, um, counterpart at uh, the Green Bay Water Utility and then at the City of Green Bay and they had just put out an RFP so I was looking to potentially join with one um, or, or see what they're doing and I said oh uh, that's terrible and they said well you know you could you could piggyback off of our results and negotiate your own price and go that route. Um, traditionally with an RFP um, you, you tend to do things in your own municipality. An audit is an audit. It's a little bit different. Um, 
what the audit's going to happen for the village of Alloway, city of Green Bay, village of Eshwabon, and city of De Beer. It's going to be the exact same service. It's just the scale and the scope of the service. So how many man hours does it take? They're still going to audit your financials the same way. They have to follow federal accounting rules, things like that. Um, so I thought it would be a good idea um, to do that in lieu of time, quite, to be quite honest with you. Uh, if I did my own RFP, I would probably pick up the phone and call someone who just did it, have them send me the RFP, edit, replace their city name with our village, and submit it. And the responses would be very similar. Um, these, the, the companies that are going to respond to that are not going to be a small mom and pop shop. It's going to be one of your larger uh, auditing firms. Um, and there really aren't too many in the area, so you're, you're looking at the branching out within the state, probably in Milwaukee, Madison, the Valley, uh, other areas that are going to respond probably could identify most of who they are going to be. Um, and they're going to do the same thing. They're going to take whatever their most recent RFP was, alter it very lightly, and send it back. So I feel like this is a good opportunity for the village um, to take advantage of something that had just kicked off. Um, so when the city of Green Bay, the Green Bay Water Utility, and the Green Bay Transit are three separate entities, they have a grouping together in their audit, <coughs> audit RFP. And so what I'm asking is that we can we, um, whatever their results are, we would piggyback off that, but then we can negotiate our own rates. Most likely they're going to have somewhat of an hourly rate, and then it's going to come down to, you know, how many hours do they need for our services versus it's a set dollar amount. That's typically how that works. Um, so what I'm asking is if, if, the, if the board is okay with us going with that approach, we are not obligated to go with that result if we don't like it. If we can't negotiate a price, we could at that point turn around and just do the RFP uh, the traditional way where we would submit it out ourselves, take in the bids, and then and work that way. We are not, um, this type of RFP is not a low bid. Uh, it's it's not required to take lowest bidder, so it is it's a little bit different in that way from a public works project or something like that. When this came from finance and personnel, I voted against the piggybacking aspect of it. Not that I'm opposed to changing audit services, just the RFP's P uh, process, basically. I didn't. I just wanted some time to think about this a little bit, and I understand Greg's point of view on using the using the recommendations that come forward or the the recommendation from the RFP. But it just, I just had too many questions. It's like, is there some companies that are out there that are just as qualified as their Green Bay gets in their RFP? that would be more uh, aggressive towards trying to get a Schwab in it because of the size of the municipality versus a big entity like Green Bay. So I mean that's that's sort of sort of my thinking of it, you know, just from a business standpoint. You know I, I um oh, go ahead. You know, just how to, is that the right thing to do? I, I just if, I, I just had some questions about it, but I, I agree that it should be done. It's just how should we do it? That's I would the, say, uh, Mark, that if the water utility and the transit were not included in that RFP, you know, to compare Green Bay to Ashwabnan, you are not going to maybe get exactly the same amount of, of um, RFP responses. But because they have the water utility and the transit authority in there. And, and we don't have to take who, who they negotiate with. So we can always go out and get the negotiation. And so I'm comfortable with, with this process. Greg, you're the party that has to work with this. Are you comfortable in going with this and then have the versatility if it don't work that we would go in another direction? Yes, I, I, I feel very comfortable with that. Um, I, talk, I also talked to a Village of Howard, um, who I contact over there. They had just two years ago gone through a similar process, and they're actually um, doing the same thing. They're actually changing after a year. That you know, goes to tell you where we're at. And they're just going to go off of their list, what they had in the prior year. But the, I kind of asked who was on there, and it, it it's kind of like the banking services if we did an RFP. There's only so many banks that can, can handle yep. the size of our business and operations. But yeah, to answer your question, I'm comfortable. If, if there's something there, there's a red flag, yeah, we just 
we just start over then. Okay. Uh, if there's something not right in that RFP or there's, you know, their pricing isn't what? negotiable or something so like that, then we just start over. When you think about this, Greg, though, I mean, the thing about an RFP is re recommendation for, you know, work, basically, you know, who you're going to take in the bid. Um, I just, when you think about it, though, we're, we could just negotiate a contract with somebody else if we wanted to. If we wanted to, we could do that. We don't have to take the recommendation. If we don't have to take the recommendation of the the combined RFP, and we can negotiate our own contract, why don't we just go negotiate a contract we want to negotiate it with? Because this will simplify the responses. Huh? Well, this first will simplify of all, the responses. The RFP process really is, is you want to make sure you go through that process to identify who can actually handle the services that you need. Right. So I'll go, you know, we have to make sure that it isn't, and, and there's a lot of great small accounting businesses out there. They just can't handle, you know, first of all, we're government. So that narrows the scope significantly yep. of who can actually do it. So there are drastic, there are significant differences between government and, and private or public business, or p private business. So that right there alone eliminates a lot of options. Mm -hmm. So they're going to go through that exercise to ensure that you've got not only a qualified candidate, but someone who can handle our type of operation, which is municipal government. Um, and so that's why you do the RFP, because you want to make sure that they can they can handle that. So a lot of these types of RFPs, in fact, a lot of municipalities, what they'll do is they'll just call the league, and the league will give them some you know, boilerplate RFP. So I'm not worried about what's in the RFP, because an audit is an audit. They can't say, oh, you're Ash Robin, and we'll just do this. Everybody has tips. Every, they, don't, they don't change how they do the audit based on, you know, um, what government you are. It's a government. You have to follow all these rules. I get it. So I, I just don't, I think that they're going to go through that vetting process to find those who are qualified to handle the scope and the size of what we do and, and who we are. And then from there, um, we could then negotiate with um, that option. And if we don't like it, um, then we do it on our own, which at this point in the game, means I'm not going to do it probably till next year. So in order to, at this point, to start it today, to get somebody in, in place by the time I need to the preliminary audit at, at the end of November, early December, um, they've already got that out there. I would have to kick this off, get it out. Um, it just, the timing wouldn't work for this year. So it, it would just push us off another year. This, this, this exercise will allow us to determine who will best serve us. As Greg has indicated, there's only a handful of firms that can do it, and it's not every mom and pop that can do it. And in essence, the proposal, the RFP, the request for proposal identifies those who are going to be qualified, and you're going to get the best possible dollars that they're going to be able to put out there for Green Bay and the, the transit and the utility because those are those are big customers. You want them, and so basically, if we can write off a write off on that course with them, and and piggyback. That's a win-win for all. And if it doesn't work out, then we'll have the same auditing firm for one more year, and we can allow Greg to go out and get a proposal on our own. But I think this is the best of both worlds. We get to see what the big boys get mm -hmm. and see whether we can get that same proposal. Right. Right. It, it, it really makes sense, Mark, to do it that way. Greg, I respect what you do for the village and the job that you do. Uh, if this is your recommend, recommendation, I move to... Uh, uh, approve the uh, village to piggyback with the city of Green Bay, Green Bay Utilities, and the transit RFP. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve to allow the village to piggyback with Green Bay, mm -hmm. the transit, and the water utility for the RFP. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Number 10, items for next agenda. If anybody has anything, give us a call at the office. Number 11. Closed session items. During the meeting, the Village Board of the Village of Ashwaubenon may convene into closed session pursuant to A, 
Wisconsin Statute Section 19.851E for the purpose of possible discussion and action on deliberating or negotiating the purchase of public properties, the invest, investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business regarding parcels VA-56-4-1 and tax incremental districts three and five where competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. B, Wisconsin Statute Section 19.851C for considering the employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee, including the Village of Eshwab and an employee request for leave of absence over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. And C, Wisconsin Statute Section 19.851F for the purpose of possible <laughs> discussion and action on considering the Village of Ashwab an employee request for leave of absence and financial, medical, social, or personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons, preliminary consideration of specific personnel problems, or the investigation of charges against specific persons except where parens B applies, which, if discussed in public, would be likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data or involved in such problems or investigations. The Village Board may thereafter reconvene an open session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute Section 19.852 to report the results of the closed session and consider the balance of the agenda. Motion to go to closed session. Second. Motion and a second to go into closed session. Voice vote, please. <clears throat> Roll call. Allison Williams. Yes. Trustee Paul. Yes. Trustee Zerbel. Yes. <laughs> Trustee Mark Williams. Yes. Trustee Steve Kabaki. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Trustee Michael Malcheski. Yes. President Kardoski. Yes. We are in closed session. <laughs> 